mission or each each day of the shuttle mission and break the tape down and I just found myself in the unique position of having the means to do it the, I was in a position to do it and I had all the motivation the second the shuttle countdown began I recorded and I stopped recording when it was at a full stop right so it, it was a pretty demanding exercise. Well, the SDS-61, uh, which is, was the Hubble Space Telescope mission, was 36, I seem to recall, 36 tapes with eight hours per tape. So these are, you know, you just had to keep going. Some flights are five days, some are 11 days, 14. The Hubble Space Telescope mission, I chose that mission, not because I knew about a CCD camera or anything, I chose it because the NASA had decided to make this the showcase mission. It is a very important mission. The Hubble Space Telescope is the very most delicate and important thing, and these gentlemen were going to spacewalk for seven days and fix it. So right. it was even interesting for me to just watch them work in this environment. And from the very first moment the first download came, I found our spherical phenomena. Did, did, you, did you set out to try and find the phenomena, or did it start off as a, a sort of self-education exercise in, in watching the mission footage? It, it was everything. It was a self-education thing. It was a curiosity that, of why no one from, 19, from the year 1991 until 1994 had bothered to look at any other footage and I was quite naive and wasn't aware it was all being downloaded because I bought into the popular culture or the urban myth that they were scrambling at it and it wasn't available since 48. I've been an editor for 25 years as well as everything else and I can I, I spend an awful lot of my day looking at videotape in, in, at amazingly fast speeds, reviewing people's programs for critique reasons and things. Sure. My eyes are trained, and I kept seeing something. So when I started breaking the frames down, I found you still couldn't find it. You'd go from for this frame to this frame, and there'd be a quick movement. So then I, I had to get a videotape recorder, an SVH machine, an older model, funny enough, not the digital model, that literally, when you rolled the thing, it would break the frames into, into fields. And in reality, there are 60 individual pictures that make up one second of video. And that's when I found them. So you were, you were finding these on one of those 60 frames? Is, one is... of the, I found, in fact, the first one I found, I only found one. Right. And then I thought, well, I should be able to, if this is real, I should be able to do it again. And then I found two. And it just went from there. What should we really be seeing? How did you know that we were looking at something that was, that, that shouldn't be there, that was unusual? I mean... It, well, the first thing is that in my career, usually in one second of video, no movement happens. You can, you can look at 60 frames and you know, the way the movement goes, very, not very much happens. It's not like those flip things where the little sure. thing moves when you flip the pages. Literally in 60 of those, nothing happens. Something was happening literally between <clears throat> one thirtieth of a second and one thirtieth of a second because there's 30 frames per second. So it was just sort of a, let's look at this. And, and it, when I found it was in a scan field and then it, the way it works is it scans and scans very fast. But the phenomena seemed to have disappeared by the second scan. So it was moving very fast. Very fast. So having, being a manager and being in charge of a television station, part of my staff is a technical staff. So I started consulting our technicians on, to, to, to destroy my, my uh, discovery. I wanted them to, 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 to tell me that they you could You wanted to hoped. critique it as heavily as you I wanted them to could. tell me this. This, this somebody could fake this. You can't. Then I took the sample, to make a long story short, eventually made it up 
to the scientific community and to a think tank and a behavioral lab and a physicist and astrophysicist. And they kind of, you know, just, uh, pay, you know, they just humored me at the start. By the end of our meetings, they had their hands on the control. They were running up to the screen and they were holding meetings. They broke the entire pixel, pixelization process down and found it was still there. It, it, so they really didn't expect to, to see anything in no, the beginning, but by the time you no, finished, they were excited. I think they expected probably that we'd have more of a real-time phenomena, which, 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 which is still spectacular. And probably, I guess, that they felt yeah. they might be able to explain to you as something yes. perfectly uh, legitimate or normal yes. for... Well, you never know who's in the Skeptic Society of British Columbia. For instance, the X-Files actor, William Davis, who is the cigarette-smoking man in the X-Files, um, is a member of the Skeptic Society. So I never knew with these scientists what where they were all what they were trying to do to me sure but the amazing thing about this other phenomena the, the one you that's virtually I, I would say it's invisible although it isn't once you see it you begin to see it all the time is it blew their minds it blew their minds did and, they offer any explanation for what they thought it might be or um, are they as as uh, baffled? there's a a professor at Simon Fraser, Professor Weinberg, who, who literally said it had to be what it, it had to be actually there, doing exactly what it was, but he could not. He said we would have to bring, we would have to go right to NASA, and eventually, uh, we had a lecture at the planetarium here in Vancouver by one of the Hubble, uh, Poobas, the chief chief. Hubble designers, engineers. I, that must have been a great opportunity. It was a too. great opportunity. And what was interesting is when we showed them the spherical shapes on video clips, uh, on video stills, he was comfortable, which meant, you know, he, you know, he could throw the ice crystal theory, or at, because it was a very small sample at that point. It was only the at the first time I'd ever done it. Uh, at that point, he confirmed that what you were showing him were ice crystals, or no? He just thought that that was basically. Um, he accepted that it was a phenomena of some sort. He he just well, they're comfortable at NASA because James Oberg, who's the NASA debunker, in my estimation, had basically briefed them all that don't worry about all this stuff you see, because uh, that's just that's just all kinds of stuff you don't understand about ice crystals. Um, so, they, they, he didn't have any, you know, it was the Hubble fellow at the planetarium in the, after yes. the lecture with the head of the planetarium. Um, he, he sat there comfortable, but when the still frames of the, this uh, second, second phenomena were, were shown to him, he stormed out of the room. Did he say anything? Did he give any reason? He made some huffs and puffs and stormed out of the room. Now we found, I, f I mean, it, that's very unusual kind of reversal. And we obtained, we meaning my, uh, 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 an artist friend and I, who's um, got more guts than me, I guess, in terms of walking through front doors, which you're not supposed to. He picked up the phone after he got the number and phoned this fellow. And he got hello, and, w and the second he said who he was, there was back talk, things like, it's that guy, blah, 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 and the phone went down. In other words, we have, communication was cut off. Not, not a very good public relations exercise no, for the... No, but we found it odd that, you know, these are okay and these aren't. So anyway, I, that's how it started. So he, Professor Weinberg, who's a wonderful man, um, said to me, something he's never said to anybody before. He actually sat down, sort of rolled his hands through his head and whatever hair he had, and, and said, uh, you know, I believe there are things out there, and it's just a matter of an et cetera, et cetera. Well, my, my friend, my partner, could not believe he knows this gentleman has worked through the Canadian Space Agency with him. This Professor Weinberg studies the uh, effects of space travel on the brain. Right. And shapes and whether they 
you know, why, they're, why they come home depressed. Elizabeth Bondar, our famous first woman in space, um, it, ha it isn't generally